It is a cruel and unusual punishment to put me on after that. <laughs> Actually, I, I discover I do need an, an introduction these days. I was going through Waterloo Station the other day. A little man came up to me and said, Here, he said, Here, didn't you used to be Paddy Ashdown? <laughs> there you go. I, don't you just love these events? I mean, that, that Callisto, oh, what guy? Sort of early version of Michael Gove, really, don't you think? <laughs> and I, I was. <laughs> Okay, that's not supposed to be taken seriously if there's a journalist in the room. Uh, I was thinking as I was sitting there, actually, you know, didn't you get a, didn't you get a sort of better class of folk at this kind of event, at literary events? <laughs> I thought what I'd do, and I was, idea occurred to me, and I was listening to my wonderful colleagues, um, that I'm going to introduce in, in, in Parliament the Electoral Reform Brackets Literary Events Bill, which says you can only have a vote if you've been to a literary event in the last year. And, and, and who knows, you might even get better government. What do you think? Yeah, it might, it might just be the only election in which the Lib Dems don't get completely wiped out. <laughs> okay, 10.15 on the 5th of June, 70 years ago, um, the BBC French service sent out 187 coded messages to all the Maquisar units across France. They were all different, by the way, but they all meant the same thing. The hour of your liberation is at hand. D-Day is at dawn tomorrow. Rise and fight. And they did. Eisenhower knew when he gave that message that for all of those resistance units in the south of France, he would not be able to sa save them. They would break cover. The Germans would get to them first. They would be, in many cases, slaughtered. But he needed the Germans kept off balance so we could succeed in Normandy. And this is the story of one of those Maquisards, the biggest ones. On the Vercore plateau, see if this works. No. <laughs> see if it works the other way. There we are. On the Vercore plateau, just by Grenoble, protected by 3,000 foot cliffs on all sides and gorges, a wonderful, glorious place in the winter uh, and again in the summer. A place of refuge over the years, and in 1940, when France fell, the Vercore, that's it, um, positioned commanding the routes up the Rhone Valley and the route Napoleon um, to the town of Grenoble, the city of Grenoble. When, uh, in 1940, France fell, the Vercors was in the south southern zone, and immediately people started to think, could the plateau, could this extraordinary plateau be used um, in accordance with its own function as a place of refuge? And slowly, starting in 1941, a group of people came together these two were writers, intellectuals. In the early spring of 1941, they started, while well, cutting down a walnut tree below the Vercors, to discuss how they could use the plateau as a point of refuge for people to gather to help with the French liberation when it came. But two weeks later, these all socialists gathered in a cafe behind Grenoble Station to plan the same thing. And by the way, set a standard in which France could be in future more socialist and republican than it had been before. In November 1940. Three, sorry, November 1942, uh, the Germans occupied the whole of the southern zone of France, dismantled the French armistice army, and many of its officers took to the forests and plateaus, forests and, uh, and high mountain pastures of the Vercors, where they formed up as informal army units. And again, later on that year, the young men of uh, France were conscripted into the service du travail obligatoire, Many of them, thousands of them, across France, but hundreds of them came up to the Vercors to, to escape being sent on uh, conscripted labor to uh, Germany. They were young men, here they are, and those years, uh, that year throughout the end of 1942 and into 1943, they were just students who were avoiding conscription to Germany. But soon, um, it was decided they'd start to train them in the forests and in the valleys, um, and military teams were sent in, French military teams, to give these young men, look at how old that one there is, uh, to the, the, the skill to be able to uh, fight when the moment came. They were also taught some rather unusual skills. This man is called Fabien Rey. He, he was a poacher who taught them how to live off the land. Very soon, the entire Vercors community was sheltering these young men, about 2,000 of them, 
in high camps and in the mountain huts of the plateau. Um, this one, and all of them helping to protect them. This lady is called Meme Borda. She's a Vercors resident. She runs a restaurant on the Col de Rousset, uh, the southern entrance of the Vercors plateau. One day the Italians turn up. The Italians, of course, allied to the Germans, seeking a Mackie band. She denies all knowledge of them. What are these Mackies are? We don't know what they are. They're mythical creatures. I've never seen them. The Italian officer returns the charge. You must have seen them. They passed through the, your restaurant only two days ago. The, me, the wonderful Meme Borda lifts her skirt, pulls down her knickers, points to her back, back, uh, backside and said, if you really want to find them, I'm sure you can find them up there. <laughs> he left in confusion. This is a piece of video, but unfortunately we can't show it on this. But it shows the Makizar um, gathering on the high mountain plateau and preparing um, to receive arms. And on the 11th of November 1943, the first drop of arms came with three Halifax bombers on this high mountain pasture um, and parachuted in the first arms sent from Britain. A remarkable moment, because now they were not alone. They were being supported from London by brave RAF pilots who flew down by night and dropped tons of arms to them on the high plateaus. What came next was winter, and the winter of 43, uh, 44 was a bitter, bitter cold, sorry, 42, 43, was a bitter, bitter cold winter. Now the young men were sitting up in the high mountain, uh, high mountain huts surrounded by swirling snow and driving each other mad. Many of them left to go down to the valley to return home, but a few of the more resolute ones stayed. And in the summer when it came, in the spring and summer, more came up to join them, about 2,000 of them up on the plateau now. Uh, and uh, they formed now a rough guerrilla army, but lacking in arms and lacking in adequate training. So the 6th of June now, um, the time when those uh, messages were sent out, they were told to rise. Uh, as the landing craft, the Allied landing craft, are sweeping into the beaches, Young men across France were saying goodbye to their mothers and their fathers and their loved ones, closing the door behind them, taking down the Sten gun hidden in the barn and going up onto the plateau to fight the Germans and play a part in their own liberation. That's, uh, they were there to help the, uh, the Allied troops get across the beaches effectively and with a minimum of casualties. Of course, it didn't work. But Eisenhower said afterwards that had it not been for them, had it not been for the Makizar rising behind the Germans' lines and keeping the German reinforcements from getting onto the beaches in Normandy and above all, keeping them guessing in their main units in the south as to whether there'd be a southern invasion, probably D-Day wouldn't have worked. The Germans, of course, by now knew everything about this, and the 157th Reserve Division, based in Grenoble, were given, this, given the task of destroying the Mackie units on the plateau. The Allies, uh, the Germans first attacked, um, this is Grenoble here, the Germans first attacked to gain entry to the plateau at a place called Saint-Nizier. Although they were vastly outnumbered and very underarmed, the French beat them back twice, but on the third attempt, the Germans broke through forcing the remainder to retreat to the southern part of the plateau, still protected by gorges, still protected by 3,000 foot cliffs, and began to hope that the Allied promises to provide them with reinforcements, heavy weapons, parachutes, would succeed. Here are the people that the Allies sent in. This one over here is arguably the greatest SOE resistance agent of the Second World War. His name is Francis Kamertz, age 28. He has control of the whole of the southwest of France, and he is up on the Vercors as his headquarters, directing operations when the southern landings come. The one next door to him, look, who looks like a, a schoolmaster, is a schoolmaster. His name is Henry Thackwaite. He was parachuted in at the end of 1942 to assess the strength on the Vercors. The one to his right is a man called Peter Ortiz, U.S. Marine Corps, larger than life. Um, he can still be seen as an extra in John Wayne, post-war John Wayne films, pretending to be an Indian. You can see why. Um, these two over here are two bizarre Englishmen who were parachuted in. No one quite knows why, because one of them could only speak a very little French and the other could speak no French at all. I think they were sent in because they wanted to be voyeurs in what they thought would be the exciting bit at the end of the war. One of them, this one here, when filling in his SOE form, said that, uh, asked where, wh where in the world did he know best? And he said, the home counties, rather honestly. <laughs> This glorious woman here is Christina Scar, the Countess Scarbeck, Polish MI6 agent before the war, smuggled uh, British soldiers across the Tatra Mountains in the snow when many others froze to death, was the first person to carry back the microfilm showing that Operation Barbarossa was about to be launched. Incredibly beautiful, 
incredibly courageous and with an active sex life to go with it. Um, she parachutes into the Vercors, makes love with Francis Camerts on the first night, um, whilst being strafed by not one but two Messerschmitt 109s. You may think showing an admirable dedication to the task on her behalf, but also you may think on his. Um, and then the, one, the French then also parachuted a man called Jean Tonissa in. His job was to make a strip so that the Allies could fly in um, with paratroopers to reinforce the plateau in the case of a German attack. And the, Ger and the French, uh, sorry, the Americans also parachuted a small commando in, about 15 strong, to train the Makizar and to carry out ambushes around the plateau. On uh, the 3rd of July, uh, the, f uh, the French uh, Fourth Republic was officially declared on the Vercors, and it was said that this was going to be de Gaulle's first home on the plateau. That's the, um, the uh, notice announcing the formation of the Fourth Republic and the Republic of the Vercors. On Bastille Day, 14th of July, 14th of July 1944, um, US flying fortresses dropped 92 tons of arms onto the Vercors plateau, but this time the Germans were waiting. The Germans immediately launched a major attack on the little village of Vassieux, which was to be the site of the landing site, pretty well destroyed it. It was the start of a major German operation. On the 21st of July, one day before the Allies were due to fly in, the Germans arrived in Dornier bombers towing gliders. And the gliders made an assault on the plateau. Um, the leading man was a man called Friedrich Schaefer. And they uh, quickly landed, ma made an assault onto Vassia, drove the French back, killed everybody in the village. It was the start of a three-pronged attack on the Vercors plateau. By air by, from the south, over the mountain passes from the east and from the north. The fighting went on for about four days. 12,000 German troops armed with tanks against 4,500 Makizar with Sten guns. Uh, and of course, the result was inevitable. The German conquest was followed by appalling massacres. Uh, special troops shipped in from the eastern front who specialized in sadistic killing and repeated here some of the appalling horrors uh, that had only occurred on, in Europe before on the Russian front, on the Vercors Plateau. Sadistic killing of a major, uh, of the most terrible sort. And about 600 Makizar lost their lives and about 200 civilians. So a defeat? No. Actually, in the end, the Makizar withdrew into the forest where the Germans dared not follow them. And the consequence was that they survived about three weeks of terrible privation, lack of water, lack of food, but when finally the Allies landed in the south, they were able to come out, they maintained their forces intact, and helped the Allies by driving the Germans off the plateau. And so it was that at the end of the day, they were able to participate, still as fully formed units, having survived the German attack uh, in the liberation of Grenoble. And so here they are, the men to whom my book is dedicated. I call them, the, the book is dedicated to the boy in the white shirt, quite literally, although some of them had spent two years, winter and summer, up on the plateau, um, resisting being captured, learning how to fight. Some had come up literally a day or two days before the German attack, had a Sten gun stuffed in their hands. And I think they were quite remarkable in their courage, badly led, let down by their political leaders, but in the end, they survived. In the end, they were able to play a part in the liberation of their country. And above all, thanks to their courage, made it easier for our troops to get across the beaches in Normandy. Thanks very much.